All right, everyone, good morning. I would like to go ahead and get started. It looks like we have quite a few people logging in here and that is great to see. Welcome, I'm Casey Chummer. I'm the Executive Director of the Idaho Wheat Commission and I would like to welcome you to From the Field, a farm chat webinar series that we try to keep short enough that it fits into your day, but long enough to cover all of the information. We hope that you will participate, participate by asking questions either in the chat box or by unmuting yourself. We do ask that you keep your microphone off until you are ready to ask a question. And I have been chatting with the guests here today and it looks like they're gonna probably throw it back at you and want to know a little bit more about what kind of um, soil health practices you have implemented on your farm. So get ready for those answers. But today we do have our second session in the month with NRCS. And if you missed the first episode, we'll put that uh, chat, that link in the chat so that you can go back and watch that. We're very happy to welcome Sean Neald, Idaho's state soil specialist for NRCS. And along for moral support and probably to help with the discussion portion of the morning is Marlon Winger. He's the regional soil spe specialist for NRCS. And as all of you know, soil health has been a major buzzword the last couple of years and Sean's really gonna help us break that down um, and then answer any other questions that you may have on that topic or others. So please don't be shy. Sean, thank you so much for being here and I will turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Casey. I appreciate the opportunity of being here today. Um, as indicated, I'm Sean Neal. I'm the state soil scientist for NRCS Idaho, and I roped Marlon Winger into uh, joining me uh, with this. He's, Marlon was our state agronomist for a number of years, and he's gone on to bigger things, being the regional soil health specialist in charge of soil health activities for Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and Utah. So um, I'm glad to have Marlon with us for this today. Um, so the the question, oh, let me explain something real quick too. The uh, the format was explained to me as a pretty brief format. And normally when we talk on soil health, I'm typically, you know, given a presentation that's like 30 or 40 minutes long. And when, when Marlon teaches soil health to agency personnel, it's a three-day class. So <clears throat> I'll do my best to, uh, to bust down this question of, of whether or not soil health is more than a buzzword in about 10 minutes. So here we go. And it's definitely more than a buzzword. Uh, soil health, we can, we can define it, we can explain how it works, we can illustrate the principles that promote it, and we can help you put it into practice. Um, I'd be remiss not to include the agency definition of soil health, uh, the continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. Um, and they, they, they packed a lot into that. Uh, continued capacity, healthy soil is a, a renewable resource. And that's what that's getting at. Um, soil, there's a lot of different ways that uh, we can explain how soil, soil functions and what its, what its functions are. I would, I would say that there's a lot of soil out there that does not uh, function to its optimal level. Uh, the definition recognizes soil as a vital living ecosystem, and it's remarkable how much life is in the soil. Um, top six inches of soil in an acre, uh, the estimate is up to uh, six tons of microbial biomass uh, in, that, in that soil. So that's several cows worth of microbial biomass working right next to your plants, providing services. It's a uh, a herd of soil health practitioners, if you will, that are at your feet. Um, so we talk about uh, soil functions, and mainly we're talking about nutrient cycling, water infiltration and availability, filtering and buffering, physical stability and support. Nutrient cycling, the microbial community in there, 80 to 90 percent of their activities right next to the plant roots, returning uh, their decomposing organic matter, returning plant available nutrients back to the soil solution right next to the plant. Um, so extremely, extremely important. Uh, water infiltration and availability, uh, a healthy, a healthy soil, 
has good pore space and good connected pore space and it allows for the infiltration of water. Uh, and again, that's supported by that, that life in the soil. The byproducts of their respiration are what we call biotic blues that are responsible for uh, the aggregation and structure that we see in the soil and the reinforcement of that pore space so that the soil can deliver water to plant roots where it needs to go rather than, rather than falling apart, sealing up and ponding water and sending your topsoil uh, downstream. Uh, filtering and buffering. Uh, the healthy soil is very effective at, uh, at at filtering and buffering things that are added to it. It has a uh, uh, soil in general has a negative charge, but healthy soil with increased organic matter has a, a boosted cation exchange capacity and is more effective at, at buffering effects of of uh, chemicals. And it can uh, the microbial community can degrade materials and uh, bind them up, make them in, inactive uh, that might otherwise be a problem. Uh, physical stability and support, that's, uh, that's the ability of your, your soil to withstand uh, stressors that are put on it by outside, outside forces. And that goes back to the structure and the maintenance uh, and reinforcement of that structure by the microbial community and the activities of the life in the soil. Um, and it's also, I forgot the last one, Habitat for Biodiversity, both above ground and below ground uh, for the plants and the microbial community. A healthy soil is uh, definitely Habitat for Biodiversity. So how does it work? What makes the difference between a soil that performs to its optimal capacity and one that just falls apart under stress? Um, okay, get ready for this next slide because there's, uh, it's, it's, visually busy and I, Marlon's probably rolling his eyeballs right now over over this one just because of the illustration on the left but um, I love this illustration it's on the cover of uh, my principles and applications of soil microbiology book and it represents an area that would fit on the head of a pin so on the left hand side this is this is a blow up of uh, a little tiny area but within it, there's a lot going on. There's aggregation of sand, silt, and clay particles by the biotic glues that I mentioned. There's a, a, a root that you can see in the top and fine root hairs. Uh, there's fungal hyphae helping to enmesh the sand, silt, and clay particles together. There's pore space that's occupied by um, both water and air. 50% of your soil is pore space. Uh, maintenance of those pores for the appropriate exchange of gases and water is a, is a huge deal on how well your soil functions. Um, the, the whole soil food web is represented in here. And what, what fuels this whole thing is uh, the plant and photosynthesis and plants sucking CO2 out of the sky, combining it with sunlight and water. Through the miracle of photosynthesis, it produces simple sugars that are up to 30% are leaked out through the plant roots and it fuels that microbial community. The microbial community is busy providing services back to the, uh, back to the plant in terms of uh, uh, nutrients and in the case of fungal hyphae, things like uh, uh, water in times of drought and phosphorus. Um, so there's a, there's a whole soil food web in there. Uh, the illustration on the right uh, splits it out into different, different trophic levels. And you can spend uh, a lot of time just, just studying the, the microbiology in the soil that, that makes that soil function um, as it should uh, to, to, to an optimal, optimal level. So real brief on how it works. Um, the principles that support it, I mentioned this, really they boil down to feeding and protecting the soil. And you feed that microbial community in terms of carbon, that's what that whole community operates on. So maximizing the living roots in the soil is important and the, and the biodiversity. And here in this picture where it says maximize biodiversity, you see a, a cover crop mix. And um, yeah, that's one way to do it. And also just in, um, diversity and crop rotation too is a big deal. Um, so we, we feed the soil, we fuel the soil biology, uh, improves its re resilience and improves the or organic matter content. Um, on the right hand side, we're protecting the soil. We're minimizing disturbance and maximizing soil cover. 
really what we're talking about here is protecting those soil aggregates. What I showed you was a micro aggregate at blow up illustration. That's the, the smallest, that's the, the foundational building block soil structure. Um, by the time you get to macro aggregates and, and heads or clumps of soil that you pull out and look in your hand, you can, you can see the, the aggregation, you can see the macro pore space, you can see that improved function in a, in a healthy soil versus one that uh, has a compromised soil structure. So we're talking about protecting the soil structure, the aggregation, which is the um, habitat for the organisms. If you can do that, you help know, boost soil organic matter, which has positive effects in terms of everything from reinforcing that structure to increasing infiltration capacity, uh, boosting CEC and available water. So, um, how can you tell if your soil is healthy? Um, you know, we said we could define it. We could tell you how it works. Um, you know, we can tell you about the principles that promote it. And we can also um, help you assess if your, your soil is healthy. Um, I, I should say there's, you can go to our uh, Idaho NRCS soil health website. So if you just punched in to Google NRCS Idaho soil health, it would take you there. And there's a section on soil health assessment and it's got a national guide on that you could use as a, you know, do it yourself. Um, that's got a lot of illustrations. It's very plainly written. It's stuff that you can take a, a shovel into the field. You could do half of it basically with just a, a shovel and your observation and your, and your notes. You can also visit our field offices. They're all over the state and our soil conservationists are more than happy to talk with you about um, resource concerns uh, to do with soil health and otherwise. Um, so um, that was my 10 minute or supposed 10 minute presentation. Open it up for discussion and that's soil health in a nutshell. And it's more than above, very much a real thing. And we can talk more about it. I, I guess, you know, I'm feeling pretty fortunate to be here today and I, to the group of just who who out there is is uh, has implemented soil um, practices or, or principles and, and and what's been your experience with it? Um, we do have a hand up. We do. Brad, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure, uh, Sean. What is a typical water infiltration rate on a bare tilled soil? that you see in the state and how high can we get that infiltration rate with some soil health practices? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I think you can find um, what we'd call canned data. It's just data that's been produced by like the lab, uh, the National Soil Survey Lab in Lincoln, where they, they've done infiltration tests on scads of, of soils and, and, and Primarily based on soil texture, they've recorded ranges for infiltration rates. Um, you know where they would say that a, um, you know a, uh, a loam could have an infiltration rate of of up to, you know, an inch per hour would be on the high high side. Um, but it, I've seen soils function where regardless of the amount of, of applied in the, with the infiltration um, testing gear, they were able to, they were able to take it, take it on um, and not produce overland flow. Um, and they wouldn't adhere to that, uh, to that kind of table data that you might, you might reference that are capable, like clay loams that are capable of, of taking on an inch per hour. Um, you can see the, so you can reference table data from just based on soil texture, get an idea of what your soil might be able to do. Um, but uh, healthy soil with good, good soil structure and macro pore space totally uh, throws that out the window. Your soils can perform way beyond what those, what those things would indicate. Um, an interesting one that I did this uh, last summer, was uh, looking at looking at some rangeland, an area that was had been pretty high use, um, kind of overutilized, and the producer recognized that. He kind of 
this one area was a little bit of a sacrifice area, but there's some sagebrush in there. We put infiltration rings in the sagebrush and then in the higher use area. And there was an order of magnitude difference on the ability of that soil to take on water that was, uh, you know, in the, in the sagebrush. I mean, like, you know, area in the sagebrush that was thick enough that animals hadn't been to it. It sucked up the water like nobody's business. The high use area took 10 times longer. So we're talking the difference between a minute uh, versus 10 minutes or, uh, or excuse me, a, a minute of that thing was more like 20 minutes to do an inch, but, and that's, that's starting dry. So at any rate, good question. Um, not a simple answer. It really depends on, on the, the health of the soil and you can get your soil to perform uh, way better than what the, what the charts might indicate. Sean, maybe I'll just add a short comment to that. In our soil health assessment, we say you're meeting the quality criteria, if you can get the second inch of water to infiltrate quicker than 10, inch, uh, 10, 10 minutes. So the second inch uh, infiltration in less than 10 minutes. And that calculation equals six inches per hour, if I remember the calculation, but that's in our soil health document. And we do that with, uh, and it's not perfect science, but we do that with a six inch ring and add an inch water to the ring and then let it infiltrate and then measure the second inch. That's, uh, and the, you know, the real easy to put together that, that an infiltration kit, if you, if you will, if you want to just use the, the rings, um, we took galvanized pipe, uh, three inch galvanized pipe uh, for our, to make our infiltration rings. I had the guys at the snow survey shop and they've got a good shop and they cut those, cut those down into, into lengths for us. And then I took them to a grinder and just sharpened one end of them um, for, so that you can, with that, um, so these things are like six inches tall, three inch diameter, and with a wood block and a mallet, you can smack that thing down into the soil halfway down and then add your water to it and time it. It's that simple. And the, um, those assessment guides available on our, our website, uh, they, they do cover that. Uh, so very, very instructive. And uh, I would encourage folks to do things like that, low cost, straightforward. Great, are there any other questions? or anybody who would like to share some of the practices that they've implemented and their experience. I know Sean would love to, to have that discussion as well. And somebody should volunteer. I'm gonna start calling people out because I know some of the people on here have, <laughs> have implemented. So don't make the teacher do that, please. I I have a question. This this is Justin, and I apologize. My uh, my voice is so hoarse. But so we talk about the fungi in the soil, and that brings a big part of that of that soil health. I I question all the fungicides that we put on in our potato programs and our grain programs. Is that affect that? Do you see any correlation between the two? Correlation between application of fungicide and yeah, and the, and the fungi in the soil. You know, I mean, is that is you know because like we'll spray like with our potatoes, we'll spray a lot of fungicide, and you know, obviously most of that hits the plant, stays there. But but you have that residue on the plant, so as as the plant deteriorates, is that you know, I guess. I've always wondered, is that affecting that fungi in the soil as well, you know, over, over the time? That's, that's a good question. Marlon, what you had your... Yeah, uh, good question. I, I don't think we know the extent of the answer. There is some literature out there that says the more fungicides you apply, the, the, the less mycorrhizal and saprophytic fungus you'll have. Uh, but we haven't done enough of that research. I think it takes, takes more time to do it, but I believe personally that 
that when you have to apply those pesticides that you probably will have reductions. Now, I think the literature, if I remember the literature, it talks about if that fungicide or fumigant is in contact with the soil, it has more detrimental effect than if it's just spray, sprayed on the plant. Uh, a lot of times the fungicides are not very, uh, uh, forget the name, uh, they don't trans, they don't trans, locate through the plant, they're often more of contact type insecticides. But if you get that fungicide in contact with the soil, it has more detrimental effect. Okay. You know, yeah, I, um, I appreciate yesterday it. I was talking with Jody Johnson Maynard, the department head for soil and water systems at U of I, and she mentioned a study that um, they were looking at onions and uh, fungicide they were using with with onions and then they're having plants with phosphorus deficiency issues and um you know the, the uh the the fungicide i guess the idea is the fungicide uh took out a lot of the mycorrhizal fungi um which are very good at, at transporting um both water and nutrients they can even do it in like two directions um so and you know areas that are, might be low in one thing they can help even out the supply by, by moving uh, the nutrients or water along those fungal hyphae. And so the idea was that those, those fungal hyphae took a, took a hit and, and that explained the, the phosphorus deficiencies. But that was related more to, more to onions, but I, I guess that's, that's related to Justin's question. Casey, I might could offer, if I can find those couple research papers, maybe I could email them to you if you wanted to post them somewhere. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I, I've, I've read the abstract introduction and summary, so I, I haven't honestly read the whole paper, but, I, but one of my other specialists from Texas sent it to me a month or so ago, and it's like, huh, I guess I better make some time and read up a little bit more. So I could send that to you if that would help. That'd be great. And we can post that with the archive of the episode as well. So that would be perfect. Um, and we can distribute it in other ways. Anybody else? I see Corey has taken off his mute. So go I was going to say, I'm not, sh not sure how to raise your hand in this. I think there was something, but there's kind of been a joke or a saying among farmers that, that soil health is about like beauty. Like we all know what it is when we see it, but defining it is a completely different story and I, I, just give me you guys' thoughts on like the Haney test is that worthwhile or is there a matrix or actual numbers we can put to this or I mean I don't know it, it's just frustrating that we all want healthy soils but there's no way to really define what that is. Um, I'll, I'll start with this I know Marlon's got um, plenty of plenty of ideas I, I there's a lot of support to indicate that just looking at uh, microbial biomass is correlated to better soil performance, soil health. Uh, uh, there's a paper out by Franz Livers is the guy's last name, kind of a funny last name, but they looked at uh, a lot of fields over a long period of time and in different uh, uh, application levels of fertilizers and um, under different management types. So this is, we're introducing a lot of variables here, but the punchline was that the, uh, the fields that had experienced the, the least amount of disturbance had the highest microbial biomass and required the least amount of nitrogen to achieve the same yield, which is, it's mind blowing. It's, uh, that paper is, is really wild. Um, but so I, I guess that answers some of your question, microbial biomass being a very, very important indicator. And there are several tests that, that get at that. What that incubation period is for the respiration is um, a little bit of a question. Um, I've read that three days is ideal, but a lot of labs don't wanna do that. Um, and the, the Haney test does a microbial a respiration test that gets at that microbial biomass number. Um, PLFA will get you a microbial biomass number, plus it will get you 
an idea of, of the community structure, who's, who's involved, is it primarily bacteria, fungi, or their protozoa involved? You know, have you got those higher trophic levels in the, in the food web? Um, yeah, Marlon, did you have something to add there? Oh think- man, that's a bad question. <laughs> you know, I talk way too much. I like to hear myself speak. A good question, Cordell. And when I started in the soil health division, I was so excited to measure everything with the labs. And you, you may know this guy from North Dakota. His name's Jay Fuhr. And I said, Jay, man, we're so excited. We got a bunch of money. We're going to do a bunch of Haney tests and PLFA tests. And he said, why? And I said, oh, because we can get some data from it. And he said, oh, that's, that's good for you. And he and I, I said, why aren't you so excited? He says, because I can tell you the same thing by looking at a shovel, Marlon. And I was too embarrassed, Cordell, at the time to tell Jay. I was embarrassed because I couldn't read a shovel full of soil. I couldn't tell you. But now over five or seven more years of experience and being on different guys' farm, it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm starting to see what a shovel will tell us. And that's what this soil health assessment is trying to get us to look at. We don't have to spend money on the tests. They're good and I love them. But you ought to be able to start reading the story from what your cubic foot of soil is telling you when you take a shovel slice out of it. Now, I've done, I've done uh, PLFA analysis and Haney tests with Cameron Williams out the wazoo. And one of the challenges is that there's kind of a fluctuation. We called Rick Haney and said, Rick, why are we seeing a fluctuation? He said, well, I hope you see a fluctuation. You're measuring a biological living system instead of just measuring inorganic ions. So I've also got a slide that I've shared for years and years of Brad McIntyre in the Boise area. We did a Haney test and we followed that field for four years and then I moved. Uh, But after four years, every value in the Haney test had a slow positive incline. And I thought, oh, that makes me feel so good that there, now it wasn't huge numbers like, but it was a slow, steady increase over four or five years. Everything we measured improved. And so that gave me some confidence. And, and also I've spent a lot of time digging holes in the ground and seeing earthworm counts on Brad McIntyre's farm, the highest in the state of Idaho, 165 earthworms in a cubic foot of soil. It's like, it, and I counted them. It's like, wow, that's pretty cool. And you, uh, you could see the granular soil structure start to change and you could see other organisms in the soil. But those tests are good. Uh, but now I feel comfortable doing these soil health assessments on your farm, Cordell. I think I could tell you if things are improving if you dig a hole in the shovel, uh, dig a, dig a, use a shovel to dig a hole. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It's it's pretty evident to tell things are improving, but I'm a numbers guy, and I don't know. I always like data to put to it. It's just it seems to me this is a hard one to do. And what's your PLFA number, Cordell? Have you done a PLFA yet? No, I haven't done that. So, so I think I, I'm not. There's a guy in Grace, Idaho, that has a over ten thousand nanograms per gram total biomass he's been doing soil health for seven or eight years now (coughs) and and so it's kind of setting the bar uh we've got other guys that are two to three thousand plfa but this kid in grace idaho he's i think it might have hit eleven thousand. so it's like oh my gosh what is the potential it's three times the potential what the book value says is a good soil the good soil says if you hit four thousand it's a very good, and this kid from Idaho, from Grace, has a PLFA, uh, has a PLFA number of over 10,000. I think it's closer to 11,000. So those are good tests. Um, you know, I think organic matter percentage is, that's one that changes slowly over time. But for somebody like that, uh, that Marlon's talking about, that that should be reflected in their, in their soil tests and the organic matter percentage. And we talk about um, uh, feeding the soil, uh, the carbon economy of that microbial community. If your microbial community is healthy, that, that organic matter percentage 
over time should be going up year to year though those differences aren't going to be really aren't going to be really dramatic but consider the effect of just one percent increase in organic matter can mean a, a, and this is a really conservative number um, you know 2800 gallons per acre uh, additional water um, one percent organic matter uh, represents uh, if you were to break it, break it down and do the math on, on bulk density and assume a carbon to nitrogen ratio, I think 10 to one, something like that, you wind up with uh, a value of something like 1,100 pounds in nitrogen in an acre uh, represented by an increase in 1% organic matter. Now that nitrogen wouldn't be available all at once, but you know, it's kind of a bank. Um, so at any rate, one one percent is a huge deal. Um, but just keeping track of organic matter percentage, we are people that in southern Idaho that are getting organic matter percentages above three percent. Uh, one producer at, at five and seven percent. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty remarkable. Brad, I was just going to tell Cordell, I'm I'm willing to pop out to your place and pull some samples and send them in for Haney and PLFA at TNC's cost, if you'd like, and just get those numbers started for you. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's, a big, that's a big thumbs up. I, I, I was going to say, be careful what you wish for, you know. <laughs> yeah. ask for. Well, I think it's important for a lot of guys that are interested to get that base set of numbers, and then you've got something to work off of. Maybe they are telling us the true story. Maybe they're not. But at least it's, it gives us a baseline. It gives us something to look at. No, that, that'd be good. And probably the biggest challenge with all this, in my opinion, is the balancing act that is your economics, your, your farm capabilities, your, your needs for crop rotation, your, you know, your balance with soil health. It's that's what's so tough about this is it's every situation is so unique it seems so I, I don't know what I'd love some guidance on what what different crop species does you know in relation to the total soil health stuff but that seems to be a bl big black hole too you know I I'm a firm believer in rotating crop species but I really don't know what each one of them's doing individually or as a unit or as it's it, there's just so much to, to try and figure out with this. Cordell, I love, uh, I love Gabe Brown's definition of regenerative ag. Quote, it's an understanding that one must work with nature instead of against her. So the more of those principles that we can all work with as producers, the better the, better the system will be. Uh, you know, I, I, I knew a kid named Dan Lakey. Some of you guys know him. He's kind of a crazy <laughs> dude, man. Uh, I remember when Dan Lakey sent me a picture of the rhizosphere of a pea root, a little seedling pea root. And he said, hey, Marlon, is this what a pea root is supposed to look like? And it's like, oh, my gosh, Dan, that's the most aggressive rhizos, <laughs> rhizo sheath that I've ever seen in my life. And, and here's a kid trying to implement some of the principles of soil health on a hundred year old farm. So, you know, I, I just love these Idaho producers. They're very innovative. Cordell, the principles we're taught are universal. How you implement them are unique to your own operation. Uh, you didn't let me pick your girlfriend, so I can't tell you how to farm, but I'll share the principles of soil health with you. <laughs> and so will Brad and so will Sean. And if you twist Dan Lakey's arm, he might share them with you too. <laughs> so Dan's on the call if he wants a chance oh. for a rebuttal. <laughs> yeah. he, he, can, he can give us his experience. I'm just here observing today. I'm uh, I'm just a listener today. All right, you're off the hook, Dan. All right, are there anybody else? I'm looking to see if anybody else has turned on their mic. If there's any other questions, or if anybody would like to share their experience and and give some advice to to fellow neighbors. Not. I'll, I'll yeah. throw in one more Great. comment, but that that working with nature instead of against it, boy, that that 
rings true to me. Uh, everything from COVID to farming, I, I, I swear, the more we try to control nature, the more it tells us who's boss. <laughs> Back hey, I've got a quick question. Well, Go yeah, ahead, Jared. Got... Well, I was just going to ask, so with an increase in infiltration rate, how much of an increased risk of leaching then do we have as you're having larger macropores that that water's moving through? It's not interacting necessarily with as much of the soil profile, so maybe there's not as much of a nitrate leaching issue, but at the same time, you have more water moving more quickly, so... I'm, I haven't ever analyzed that yet, but it's something I've always kind of wondered about. Um, I, I think the, in terms of plant, so the, I guess the concern is that you've maximized your plant available water and now we, you're just sending water to the water table. Um, I, I guess my, my response twofold, one, um, Water in soil doesn't um, just move downwards. It, it can move even upwards and it certainly moves sideways. And that's the capillarity of the soil does that. So if you've got water in those macropore spaces, you, you will be getting to other parts in the, in the soil profile just by virtue of capillarity. Um, so, and then once that soil profile is, is satisfied, um, you should be able to get away with um, increased water use efficiency, you know, a lower application rate. Um, you know, um, I'm trying to think of the numbers on Lance Griff's place with his corn. We had one side of the road was another part of the his family's operation. And his side, he'd been in no-till for three years. And the difference was, was dramatic. Um, yeah, like 30% less, something, something like that, but it's just more, more efficient. Um, I don't, I don't think you're, I don't think you're, you're necessarily sending more water to the, to the water table with the, I think your soil would just look like you'd, you'd know that it was, that it was getting saturated. And if you had soil moistures in the, in the soil, soil moisture sensors in the soil, you'd, You'd, you'd see that that happening that they'd be coming up with with less of an application rate I think uh, one of the telltale signs is in your field whenever you test your infiltration rate always compare it to the native site or the fence line you know something that hasn't been disturbed and it'll shock you to see how well mother nature infiltrates moisture and just like what Cord Cordell said it's all about emulating nature if our farms uh, soil structure functioned like the native undisturbed we'd be very happy farmers great okay anybody else Mark yeah, I, I, see. I, I have Go a ahead. quick question Go ahead, please. Um, so I'm a landowner and I'm on this call so that I can just learn more basics about soil so that I can converse with our farmers who rent the land from us. Is there a, would it be your website? Is there a place I can go to just learn like basic soil 101? Sure. Um, and if soil health is your, let's see, let me, I'm having a, I have a little bit of a hard time navigating both the, um, oh, now I've done it. I was helping some folks with some educational materials the other day, but that was for, that was for kids. Um, what I'm looking at right now is a story map that we'll have this posted on our um, soil health website through Idaho NRCS. Um, a lot of what we're talking about, you could go there and, and, and find. Um, only I can't see the the controls for the for the website. Can you, if you can email me, I can give you a load of uh, good links 
for uh, resources for soils education. I think that'd, that'd be the best thing. And then you can pick okay. through them and decide what's most appropriate for you. But I'm more than happy to do that. Thank you. And Sean, if you want to email those to me as well, we can post those on our website and distribute them to everyone who was on this call today. Yeah, I've got, I've got plenty of plenty of things that I'd love to dis distribute with, with the group, uh, including a, a plug for our um, Idaho 5 for 5 Soil Health Roundtable next week, uh, next Thursday, uh, we'll be putting that on. And I've got a flyer I can, I can send to you um, that you can send out to folks. And that's, uh, we've got several presenters on a variety of different soil health related topics. And then we open it up at the end for discussion like this. So uh, another opportunity for folks and everybody's welcome. It's pretty, it's pretty John, can you tell us where and when that is, just so everybody knows? Next yeah, week, the five for five. Yeah. There you go. So January twenty seventh, one p.m. And this flyer has a Zoom link on the bottom of it that people can use to join. Great. Okay, we will share that as well with everyone. Okay. Yeah, then, I can I can get that to you. Not a problem. Great. And is there anybody else with questions or other comments before we? Just a quick comment for Mark sure. uh, on that soil health Idaho soil health website. We interviewed the famous Dan Lakey and some of his cohorts uh, around southern Utah, and we put them on some YouTube. Uh, we got him on YouTube. And so if Dan won't talk to us today, you can see what he said a couple of years ago about soil health, some awesome videos, but they're on Sean's uh, soil health website. Great. Thank you. Great. And we did put the link to your website in the chat. So if anybody um, didn't want to Google it, it is there. <laughs> okay, great. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay. Anybody else with questions or comments? I was, just gonna say, I was just going to say quick, February 3rd, Burley is doing their soil health workshop. Uh, a guy by the name of Jimmy Emmons will be there. He's a farmer from Oklahoma that's implemented soil health practices on a pretty large scale farm. And he's the keynote speaker. So it should be a really good workshop. Sadly, I can't make it, but I encourage all you guys to go. Yes, we've we've been restricted um, for traveling to events such as that uh, also. Um, yeah, apologies, but I, I'd, I'd love to be there. That's a, that's always, that's always a great workshop. That's great. Thank you, Brad. Okay, everybody. I think that will be it for today. I cannot thank Sean and Marlon enough and everybody who participated. We, as always, will have a recording of this session on our website, on YouTube, on our podcast platform. So you can go back and watch this or any of our past episodes on those platforms as well. And please, if you would fill out the evaluation form that you'll get in the in your email, then that can help us figure out what kind of topics we want to do going forward. We want these to be as helpful to you and as relevant to you as possible. So please help us out with that. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Marlon. And we'll see everybody in the next uh, From the Field, which I believe is February 1st. Thank you. Casey? Casey? No. Yes. I was just going to say we're real easy to find. If anybody has any additional questions, wants one-on-one, -on -one, just you can look Marlon Winger or Sean Neeld up uh, through NRCS. You Google us. We're, we're easy to get to. So by all means, let us, uh, uh, let us know if you've got additional questions. That's great. Thank you very much, Sean. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you.